I am thrilled, thrilled to be here. And um, I didn't mention to Olga and Lynette, and I'm sort of embarrassed not to mention, I'm so excited to be here as a public school graduate in New York City schools as well. Woohoo! Uh, and as Janet mentioned, I credit the teachers and the education, and that's, and as you said, Deputy Mayor, that is the reason I am here, for that education, those teachers, uh, to be with you all today. So I'm going to quickly introduce our panel. Janet already gave you, Deputy Mayor, an amazing introduction, which I don't think I can match. But I do want to also mention that our Deputy Mayor here, who is basically in charge of a number of initiatives, we already talked about what you're doing for universal pre-K, which is amazing. But you are also leading the charge in terms of expanding access for middle school students to after school programs and something else called community schools which really focus on the needs of students in poverty beyond the classroom when it comes to mental health and medical care and 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 you know opportunities after the classroom after school so i look forward to hearing what you'll have to say today so thank you for being you. here also joining us Lynette Guestafero executive director of teaching matters who brings 25 years of experience to her post. Part of her magic, a lot of magic, which I've learned about getting to know her at Teaching Matters, has been developing these talent development models for teachers, teacher leaders, and principals. So far, to date, Teaching Matters has coached over 30,000 educators across 900 schools, which is amazing. And I think Lynette will be telling us much more about how teaching excellence is really that crucial way to deal with students in poverty and help close that opportunity gap. And also joining us, nice to meet you. I didn't have a chance to meet you yet. Kamar Samuels, hello, who is now Senior Director for Special Initiatives and Partnerships for the New York City DOE Office of School Design and Charter Partnerships. He has just been in that post for two months, I think, right, Kamar? <laughs> He's new to that. Before that, he was principal of the Bronx Writing Academy in District 9 for six years, a stellar principal. We are told he has done amazing things, and his school really at the forefront of some of the most innovative initiatives and programs that are really dealing with our students in need. So he's going to talk to us about that. And I just thought one little fun factoid. I always like these little things about people's bios. Before going into this important career of education, he was finance, a finance manager with the NBA, which is an... I love what you, the skills that you can bring from that to the classroom, which is amazing. All right, first, a big round of applause for our panel. <laughs> and, and I'm tape recording this for a future CNN.com story. Let's kill two birds with one stone, shall we? Right, okay, so Olga really kind of set the stage so beautifully uh, about the scope of the problem, because we were going to begin with that. I mean, Olga mentioned the number, which is astounding. 80% of students in New York City public schools living in low-income households or coming from poverty. I mean, that is a... It's an, a number it's hard to get your head around. Deputy Mayor Bury, I wonder if you can just start, what does that mean? Like, give, it, give the audience some perspective of that number. What does that mean in terms of, of these students in need? Sure, well, I'll try. Um, uh, you know, I think it, it helps to start by thinking about what poverty means. And most fundamentally, poverty is about a lack of economic resources. Um, but of course, it's more complicated than that. Uh, because uh, the lack of economic resources uh, is intertwined with a set of factors that affect people's lives. Uh, so for children, I think, in low-income backgrounds, it is not just the lack of money your family has that's an obstacle. It's that you probably live in a neighborhood which is more likely to be unsafe. You probably have poor air quality that you breathe every day. You probably live in an environment where you're exposed to violence uh, and, or, or other types of uh, crisis at an extra extraordinary rate. Uh, you're probably dealing with stresses um, that you know my children w would have no I, no idea of or how to manage. Um, uh, the food quality you have access to is probably lower. So you bring with you uh, a range of challenges, and you probably go to a school with other children who bring with them a similar range of challenges. And when you come to school that morning at 8.30, you know, you're the same kid you were at 8.29. So whatever challenge you had, if right. you were hungry at 8.29,
you're hungry at 8.31. If mm -hmm. you're depressed at 8.29, right. you're depressed at 8.31. If your family has not been able to make the investments that middle class and upper income families make, whether it's summer programs or early childhood education or after school programs, and there's also interesting research that shows that uh, the majority of the, of the achievement gap between poor and wealthy families can be explained by these differential investments that families are able to make in their children's well-being. So whatever you didn't have at 829, you don't have at 831. Um, so that brings a particular set of challenges uh, to school. Um, I think for a long time in our society, uh, we have used those set of challenges as an excuse not to do anything. All right, so there's a lot of challenges, what can we do? Um, I think often we overcompensate now uh, by now wanting to say, well, none of those things matter. Um, that teaching is teaching, and uh, a teacher should be able to deliver a quality lesson. It doesn't matter what happens um, at 829 or what happens at 331. Um, but that is false, too. Uh, so for me, uh, a truly great school is a school that has a strategy not only for excellent teaching and school leadership, but it's a school that has an excellent strategy uh, for the learning side of the equation as well. It's a school that understands that the child who lacks health insurance and therefore can't, get, um, can't see the blackboard because they don't have glasses, uh, that you have to have a strategy for solving that problem. If your children are hungry, you have to have a strategy for solving that problem. If your children are depressed or unsafe or traumatized, um, you have to have a strategy for solving that problem as well. Um, so uh, I, I guess I would say that you know, the poverty uh, affects education in every way. In the system where so many of our children come to school with so many of these challenges, we have, as a system have to have a strategy for meeting the holistic needs of children uh, who are not simply their cognitive abilities. Children are uh, they're human beings and their emotions, who they are, what they love, their passions, all those things are part of them, and we have to have uh, a way of supporting and embracing every aspect of that child if we want to give our children a chance at full success. Yeah, I just don't think most people, I'm sure you all agree, most people don't realize, right, sort of the scope of the problem and how the children are coming to school, to the classroom with all those issues that they're dealing with, you know, before they got to the classroom and then when they are in the classroom. And Lynette and Kamar, I want to bring you both in. Lynette, when it comes to the teachers, right, what is the impact on the teachers, especially if you're in a school with a high concentration, high concentration of, right. of, of, of poverty or number, large number of kids coming from low-income households. So I, I have had um, lots of concerns with a sort of a pure kind of blame the teacher conversation that's gone on with respect to this because the challenges for, uh, we call them hard to staff schools, schools with co uh, concentrated poverty, is that they, and Olga talked about this, that there is, there is just more turnover. There are high stress environments. It's, people tend to not stay in, uh, be able to stay in the role as much. But the turnover is, is higher than it needs to be. And there are, just like you said, there are systems for supporting kids in poverty. There are systems that you can put in place that extend teachers' time in schools, that affect retention. Um, and uh, to give a very simple example of kind of like sp the specific work, if children come in with a, a 15,000 word gap, over the course of 12 years in school, teachers who are teaching kids in high poverty have to have really explicit strategies about teaching vocabulary so kids can access the lesson. Kids can't do the higher order thinking if they don't understand a couple of key words necessary. So that's a strategy, that's a basic strategy that every teacher in a certain situation has to do. And there are a number of very specific techniques and ways that you can a, address and teach in, these, in the environment and that you can set up the school in the first place so that teachers are constantly developing and learning and actually uh, kind of motivated to stay in the work. Kumar, you were on the ground level, right? A principal for a number of years, doing amazing work. I'm told that after you left even at your school, there was a program on Saturday and 35 teachers showed up on a Saturday, not even raising right. questions. There's some, something you did there. Tell us a little bit about what you were seeing on that ground level. All right. All right. So I think for a principal, the first thing is a belief. Um, for me, it was a belief that education is a civil rights movement of our time. And that meant that just like in the civil rights of the sixth movement of the 60s where the church took on a new role, if education is a civil rights movement of this time, the, the school 
has to take on a new role. It doesn't. Ha it's not the place. Oh, it's not just the place you go to um, get certain you know literacy skills. It's the place where people have to be cognizant of who you are as a as a whole, right? And so, in in my school in particular, when I took over the school, we had. Um, 25 students who were living in temporary housing out of a school of 500. By the time I left, we had 105 students who were living in temporary housing. Right, so that number quadrupled. And obviously, if you do, if that happens, then it plays it plays out in your school in a number of ways. Right, um, more especially in middle school, where where you know if everything is perfect. A child in adolescence is crisis anyway, much yeah. less when, um, when you have um, the, these, these things you're contending with. And I just want to point out there's, there's poverty in the sense of, you know, maybe you're from a single parent home and, somebody, and your mom is working. There's another level of poverty when you're from, like, uh, you're living in temporary housing and you're, you're the only, and possibly the only adult in your life that's stable is the teacher you meet every single day. Right and 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 the school you have, um, and so one of I'll just go through a couple of things that we did in response to seeing this. One, I felt like our teachers had to get a good sense of what it meant um, to address students' socio-emotional needs. Right, so there is a program called. Uh, therapeutic crisis intervention in schools, which means that a teacher understands that it's not, the behaviors that are exhibited by a child come from a root cause, right? And every single one of our teachers was trained in this. It was a four-day training. You got really intense um, support and you, and you were licensed, you got like a certification at the end of it. And so at, and, and so at our school, what, what happened was in the morning, Every teacher made sure they were at the door. Every teacher was looking at the child to make sure, okay, um, are they at what they call baseline? Do they, uh, I know what triggers this student, you know? Um, everybody has different things that, that, that trigger them, and our teachers had a really good fundamental understanding of that. Something else we did was that, I was very clear in my mind when I took over the school that, you know, I don't know anybody who went to college and was successful just by going to school, and leaving at 2.30 or 2.40 or 3 o'clock and going home and doing nothing, which is what many of my students was doing. So I knew right away that I needed to get a program that extended the school day for every single one of my students if they wanted it. And we, so we recruited what I thought was the best organization in the country that does this, which is Citizen Schools at the time. And so every single student in my school went to school from 8.30 until 6 o'clock every single day with different uh, and you know what was important as well is that a day after three o'clock didn't look the same, right? right? So we had different um, activities, and we also had um, interventions. And you know because college and career readiness is was key to me. And you uh, you might ask yourself, well, you're a middle school guy. How do you know what college, what that looks like at a, at a middle school level? And, for me, it was if I had an eighth grader in my school and they were graduating eighth grade with high school credits, then I knew that that child was on a, a path to college, right? Um, and in our school, while our poverty, our, our students in temporary housing quadrupled, we also quadrupled the number of students that were receiving high school credits at the eighth grade level before they even went to high school. So that was the, that that was one key determining factor. If you um, know there is. Um, you know, th this administration is tot I'm totally aligned with their Algebra for All um, program because if, if your child is in a middle school, the question you should ask is, are they on course to graduate um, high school with credits? Because we know what happens when students are doing rem remedial courses when they end up in college, right? They, half of their money that they get for um, financial aid runs out and then they can't um, finish and that and that happened that starts at the middle school level yeah it, it, you know you're talking about so many things that work I mean obviously right deputy mayor Bury I mean these are all things um, you know what what could it take to do all of that in all of our schools especially in schools with you know concentrated areas of, of poverty well look I think the good news is that as complicated and difficult as this work is we have a good understanding of the kind of systems and investments that it would take to move these things around. And I think, you know, the, the biggest challenge for us as a city, as a country, it, it's not information so much as a failure of imagination. 
Um, and uh, just, again, to toot the horn of my boss, Bill de Blasio, when he ran for office, there were two big promises he made to the city. One is that every four-year-old in New York City would have a free, full-day quality pre-kindergarten program if they wanted it. And two, that every middle school in New York City would have a free after-school program. And the reaction to those promises uh, was um, not encouraging. Uh, and uh, because, you remember the New York Times had an editorial that said he was not a serious candidate because these were not serious promises. But a year and a half later, mm -hmm. every four-year-old today who wants a pre-kindergarten program in New York City can have one. And every middle school in New York City has a free after-school program today. The, the barrier is a failure of imagination, the willingness to say that we as a city, we as a government, can do big, extraordinary things for our children. And there's a lot more work to do. Uh, in the mayor's speech on education and equity a few weeks ago, he talked about um, algebra for all, computers for all, uh, a single shepherd program, mentoring, all sorts of investments that we know will help drive the engine forward. I think the good news is that we have a good handle on the kind of things we have to do. We don't have every answer, but we have a lot of the answers. And the question for us is, are these things important enough? Are they important enough to try and to do? And are we all willing to work together to get them done? Absolutely. I mean, look now, as you said, a year and a half later, universal pre-K, access to after-school programs in middle school, it, it, it's amazing. And the other thing that's also been part of this conversation and debate, and Lynette, you mentioned it earlier, and many of us in the room were talking about it earlier as well, is the blame the teachers. So people might look at a school, uh, maybe a failing school by whatever measurement in terms of scores, and say, oh, you know, the teachers just aren't as good. Lynette, A, what do you say to that? I know you addressed it earlier, but also how important is the development of leadership within the school in terms of retaining and training and building, building up the teaching so that these students who are coming from low-income areas are getting the, the, the teaching that students in high-income areas are getting. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a critical and essential, especially for, this, for the fo focus, which is to retain teachers in these schools, teachers that, that do the work and get, and get results. Um, one of the things that we do is specifically partner with the principal, and the, and the principals in this room we've worked with really closely, to identify those teachers that have that leadership potential. And, then, and we did this with Kumar School as well, and it was, he was a phenomenal partner. Um, targeting their skills, not, uh, not specifically on the teaching of content, which we do, but what it takes to lead other teachers, how to give feedback, how to model in a classroom, how to lead a very focused team that is, is working towards uh, developing all the teachers in the gap areas. Now remember, in these schools, you have a preponderance of teachers with less experience than you might have in, in, in more affluent schools where teachers can have 12, 15 years of experience. That's a reality. So how do you close the gap for teachers? It's, this is not their fault. It's that they're, they're coming in and they need to, the skills build. So there's sort of, we always say there's sort of four prongs. Social, the social emotional work is critical. But when we partner with the school, we're sort of doing, focusing on four things. One, the school has to come to the table with, and that is the belief that kids in poverty can perform at, and work at high levels, and that has to come from the top, and it has to pervade the school. We can't bring that to a school. That has to be in the leadership to be successful. But then the other three are places that we can really work with the school. So one is that schools have to track meticulously and be really clear what kids have to learn in the school. What are the standards they have to master, and how are they? Not some test at the end of the year that's a, uh, sort of an autopsy, but along the way, they have to be able to show what have kids mastered and what haven't they. That sounds hard. It's actually very doable. We did this with, um, again, with Kumar Samuel schools. When you have that information, you can now see, well, which kids need additional support, what areas do they need support, but you also have something else that's critical. You've got a way to look at what the gaps are for teachers, which teachers are struggling to teach certain things, and which teachers are knocking it out of the park. How can they work together? And that's where you start to see the leadership. So those teachers need to be positioned in, in ways of leading other teachers. These are teachers that, this extends their career. This is a career opportunity for them. They, you know, they came to a school, they were teaching for three years, all of a sudden they may be in a position now to lead their colleagues. That will extend that 
young person's time in a building, upwards of another couple years. So leadership is critical. Teacher leadership is is key. I, I, Kumar, you were you know shaking your head. You're obviously was you were obviously a fantastic yes. leader. What did you see from your so, work as a principal? Yeah, I'll add um, probably one thing to um, what Annette said that time for teacher teams to sit and plan and work with each other real time to adjust their instruction for students' needs. Um, those, I think that's one critical piece because um, a lot of teachers talk about the support that they receive. And quite frankly, you know, when, when a teacher says they receive the most support in the building from a principal, I mean, it might help my ego, but it's actually not good for a teacher. Right? They need to be supported by their colleagues the most, right? And that's one of the things that we got to at um, BWA because we, made, we were purposeful in our program to make sure that teachers had time to sit together, to do the necessary analysis of the data by standards, and also to plan together and to visit each other and see what practices were working and what practices weren't working well. Um, and I think if you do that, if you have an open environment, which takes a lot of work, um, teaching is just historically a profession where people close their doors and you know leave me with my kids and I'll take care of this. But we needed, we worked on having an open culture where teachers were talking to each other and looking at the data together and then visiting each other and trying to um, adjust their practice as, uh, as needed. I wonder also, from your perspective, when you had those new teachers, right, who might not have had the experience or, the, or you know, developed skill set, what were some of the biggest challenges they mm -hmm. faced, and how did that support on the part of their teachers and your support right. help them get right. through so, it? Yeah, I mean, be, if you ever meet a first-year teacher, just um, give them a hug. Yeah, I mean, right. Give a, a big hug. <laughs> me, a big me, hug. Being a first-year teacher is tremendously difficult. Um, if you have, and I didn't realize how difficult it would have been when I was my first year, and then I had a child, just have, having one child, and how difficult. By the way, my child is six, so he missed out on the floor. <laughs> but anyway, um, so, no but, <laughs> <laughs> so truthfully, though, um, it's so, it's so difficult for a first year teacher, but it's so important that they have that time with their colleagues and, and that you know, they have a supportive principal, that they have somebody who, who could help them in the process of reflection. And quite frankly, it begins at the hiring process, right? Our, our school's hiring process was designed for two, to look at two things, right? Did you believe that our kids could learn and could, did you, could you reflect when you failed? Right? Because failing in the first year of teaching, is teaching, you have to just get used to it. You will fail all the time and it had to be an environment where you were, it was okay to fail and it was okay to try and fail and then your colleagues would lift you up and you would be given support around a direction um, uh, for, for your class and how, and how you are going to um, try new things to help your kids succeed. Yeah, that is all great. And you also mentioned, Kumar, earlier, you know, that sort of social emotional component, mm -hmm. training your teachers, yes. having them be aware of it. Deputy Mayor Bury, I wonder if you could wade in here on an, the community schools aspect and how are these community schools helping when it comes to mental health, medical needs, you know, after school, so that the teachers are supported by those needs being taken care of so that they can focus on what's going on in the classroom too. Yeah, no, so just in, in the way uh, you were describing, the community schools initiative, and there are now 130 uh, community schools that have been established by the administration. It's really an attempt to support the holistic needs of children by giving the school a strategy to meet children's broader needs. And I think one of the things that's important, you talk about the challenges of being a teacher and the challenge of being a school. You talked about the culture of teaching being one of closed doors. Well, that's the culture of schools as well. Mm -hmm. The culture of schools are to have closed doors and not to let the environment, not to let the community in, uh, not to let parents in. I think the, the basic principle of a community school is that in trying to meet the comprehensive needs of children, you don't have to do that by yourselves. The principal and the teacher don't have to do that by themselves. Well, you need to the strategy for engaging the broader community. And so, you know, essentially what a community school does is it brings in those resources into the school building. So for our 130 community schools, um, the main thing they all have is a partner, uh, generally a community-based organization, a nonprofit, like a citizen school or some other organization, um, which is given money to hire staff 
whose job it is is to coordinate with the principal to do a couple of things. One, to understand what are the, the, the distinct needs of that school community, because a school in Washington Heights is going to have a very different need than a school in mm -hmm. Northern Staten Island. So to understand what the needs of the community are, and to then have the capacity to go out and develop partnerships to bring them into the school uh, so that the school has the, the resources available for children and families. Uh, and, in, and to take some of that work off the principal, I mean, it's still a principal-driven strategy, but to give the principal the resources through this partner to help figure out what those needs are. Here in New York City, there are some basic things that we think every school needs, so um, we built some of those things into the model. So each community school has resources for after-school education. Each school has resources for mental health services. Um, so we do a, a basically evaluate what the school needs are and either build a mental health clinic or develop resources that the school can meet mental health needs of kids. Um, and then there's some citywide partnerships we've developed. So for example, um, every child in the community school gets uh, free vision screening and thanks to our partners at Warby Parker, uh, Warby Parker is going to give free eyeglasses to every child at those schools uh, who need one. Um, and they're very cool eyeglasses. Too cool for me, but very cool for <laughs> so, um, so there's something that we develop centrally, but, but it's really not so much about those list of things. It's about having a partner to figure out what the school community needs. Um, and for some communities, it'll be really a lot of work around immigrant families. For others, it'll be around having a housing strategy. Um, and so uh, we, we just feel like um, trying to figure out how do you Give schools and give schools and principals and teachers teachers the partnerships, the resources that oftentimes exist in communities. Um, the museum that might be down the block, the small business that wants to help, giving them, these folks in the community a way to come into the school and offer their assistance in a coordinated fashion. Um, we do believe is one critical element element on the way to having schools that are designed to serve all children effectively. Lynette, have you seen community schools and how they're impacting any schools teaching matters is affiliated Absolutely. with? Absolutely. This, this issue of a willingness to partner, because that's what teaching matters is. We are a partner. We're an, a partner which is focused on the academic work and the teaching quality. So schools that we partner with are those schools that have actually opened up to partnerships. And we find that they're actually the schools that are often enormously successful with kind of community schools. So these are schools, and it's true, it's, it's like a competency of a principal that understands how to bring partners in, um, whether it's social emotional, whether it's instructional. Um, but those schools tend to, and we, I have to say that the teacher, the principals in this room that won this award, that really, really moved the needle, they are excellent at partnerships. That's, that's one of their key competencies. Yeah, I, I love the audience. I know we were so touched, I think, when Olga talked earlier about um, the first graders that she was sitting with, and one of them was teaching her how to, how to solve a, a big word. I wonder if each of you can talk a little bit about what everyone in this room can do, right? What is one thing, one takeaway we can all leave this lunch with about what we can do when it comes to this issue of poverty and the impact on our schools, on our students, on education? Maybe Deputy Mayor Bury, you'll go and then we'll go down the line. Mm, that's a good question. So I, I, that's a hard question to answer because I think everyone <laughs> can contribute in different ways, right. right? I think the one thing, one thing that everyone can do is everyone can contribute to a political environment where change is possible. So I, for me, one of the things that has been the most uh, frustrating part of this work is that the, the political environment around education is extraordinarily toxic um, in a way that's sort of a little difficult to understand, but extraordinarily toxic. It's hard to have basic, adult, civilized, <laughs> evidence-based conversations around these issues. Um, because if, if person A disagrees with person B, it's never that, well, person B, I think your facts are wrong. It's that person B, you hate children, and why do you want children to fail, and <laughs> right. why are you the devil? Yeah. <laughs> Which is usually not a productive way no, to engage You don't get very far. <laughs> so I, I guess what I would say is, you know, everyone here can invest in different ways. Um, uh, and for those who are principals, I mean, obviously, you're already giving your life to this work. But if we could all find a way to engage in a more productive conversation um, around what children need, uh, one that sort of goes beyond the sound bites and the hostility and just sort of gets to the hard work, uh, I think it would be much easier to have a productive 
to have productive work moving forward. And it's not your question, but can I tell a quick story? I'm sure. I want to tell a quick story. Um, this is a self-serving story, uh, I will announce. But I went to visit the pre-K program a couple of weeks ago, and um, it was in Brooklyn, in Bay, and I was just really moved by this. In Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, it was a classroom where uh, there are lots of English language learners. Uh, and so there were kids who didn't, there were some Russian speakers, some Spanish speakers, and this new teacher um, who also had like the deputy mayor and all these people in her classroom, which I'm sure wasn't that exciting. Um, <laughs> she needed two hugs. Yeah, she, she needed two she, hugs. She needs a lot of hugs. Um, but she was telling me in a very animated way how this was like a month into school, and she was telling me how in a very animated way, I was asking how, how do you do that? Because not only don't the kids speak English, but their parents don't either. Uh, and she was like, well, one thing that's been sort of better now is that they're starting to learn the routine of the class, the kids. So it's a little bit easier now because we don't have to tell them everything to do every time. But what was really cool is that now some of the students were starting to learn some English words and how all the other kids um, would get really excited when uh, one of the non-English speakers would use an English word. And you know, the one thing I thought about this experience, well, a couple of things. One, it was just sort of cool to see this first year teacher, like, who was clearly going to be an amazing teacher because it just, her excited, she, she was excited about this. She was not, um, like I would have been freaked out and demoralized by all this. <laughs> um, but but uh, I just sort of thought about like what a difference this was gonna make for those four-year-olds. Because in the alternative, they would have showed up to kindergarten not speaking any English. But now when these children start kindergarten, they will be English speakers. Mm. And I just use that, I just use that example to say that the things we do as a society, like the, they really matter. These investments we make, they really matter. Even when we don't get them right, if they're not perfect, it's worth remembering that we can make a real difference if we're willing to put our resources towards it. Um, and so I just wanted to share that story because it's been one that has been inspiring me over the last couple of weeks and awesome. that this yeah. stuff really matters. It's awesome. You know, Lynette and Kamar, if you guys, a message to the audience, you know, what could every person, the average person do when it comes to this issue? Lynette? I, I think people have to engage and, and pay attention and think broadly about, uh, you know, it's not just about the schools, it's about uh, policies around poverty. So one, I would love you to come and see for yourself. I think just one visit and, you know, is, is, makes a big difference. And the second is um, there have to be discussions around issues of mixed income housing and minimum wage. These things are completely tied to the work. Um, I know I'm, I'm supposed to focus on the education piece, but we have many children coming to our schools from homeless shelters whose parents are working minimum wage jobs. And it's penny wise for these companies, but pound foolish for our economy for, to not just at least have a discussion about what this looks like on the ground um, you know, in this city w with these. These issues are tied directly to our work. Um, I'll start by saying what I did, I think, to get involved um, in education, I really thought about what was my life's purpose. And I, you know, I reflected on the 60s um, civil rights movement and decided this was the civil rights movement of our time. And you know, I always thought, what would I do if I were living in the 60s? And, 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 and the point I'm making here is that you, it, starts with a belief, right? So I think as you reflect on who you are, where you are, what your role is, think of the kid who, you know, is putting on their clothes every morning and being walked to school by their parent every single day and who might not who, who might want the same things you wanted for your kids, definitely want the same things you wanted for your kids, and for whatever reason, that, that is not happening, right? Some people say it's a teacher, some people say it's... You, in, certainly in my school, there, was, there were volunteer opportunities through citizen schools that I mentioned earlier. There are um, you know, organizations like Teaching Matters. There are just a whole host of things that, if it's not financial, it's time, time matter, matters to, um, that you can really do to get involved. And I think, as Lynette said, a school visit, there's nothing like it. I'm, I miss my school every single day. So a school visit, and I know I had like maybe about 13 of you in my school last year, and everybody, everybody, all the kids probably remember that visit. Mr. Simons, who are those people? <laughs> but, um, but, but the point is, um, a site visit is critical. So if, it, if that's what's going to speak to your heart. 
Kumar Samuels, Lynette Questafero, Deputy Mayor Richard Bure. You're fantastic. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.